This morning as I come, I <clears throat> have had a, uh, a wonderful opportunity this week. Some of you knew that I was going to be out of town for a day or so, but actually a couple of pieces of a day. Um, but uh, a few months ago, I was invited to, uh, to go back to Oakland City and to speak at the chapel service and uh, on Wednesday as they had uh, their chapel service. And uh, I didn't give... I appreciated the invitation and looked forward to it. It's been some several years now since we had gotten to go back. So it was a, a wonderful opportunity to get to go. I didn't realize until Monday, um, as I was kind of preparing for the trip, getting things taken care of here that needed to be taken care of, uh, it happened to dawn on me. And uh, of course, uh, with the gray hair, with gray hair and all the things that go along with that, I had to actually go look at my diploma to remember exactly when did I graduate from there. And it turned out that uh, it's 30 years this year since I've been gone. I don't feel like it's been that long. It feels like just yesterday. I'm not even 100% sure that I'm 30 years old yet. <laughs> Kelly says I don't act like it. So, uh, but anyway, it was 30 years. And uh, on the way, I had the opportunity uh, to uh, actually make a phone call to um, a gentleman that most of you will know. He grew up here in the church, Brother Ray, Dr. Ray Barber. And uh, Dr. Barber and I got to visit uh, while I was driving for about an hour and a half or two hours. We had a, a splendid conversation, and I have extended to him the opportunity to come back and to speak for us if he's in the area. And uh, so, but anyway, Dr. Barber uh, wanted me to extend uh, hello to everyone, and, uh, and uh, he looks forward to coming and being with us at some point. And uh, we look forward as well, and so we appreciate him and the impact. He had not been at Oakland City very long when Kelly and I left. And so, um, uh, but I did get to know him and have gotten to know him down through the years, and I appreciate Brother Ray and his testimony. Uh, some of you will know and remember Dr. Doug Lau, who grew up between here and Bernie. And uh, Dr. Uh, Lau is actually, uh, he was one of our professors. And he is uh, retiring this year at the conclusion of this year. And we do need to be in uh, much prayer for the university. Uh, we have a very great shortage right now of, uh, as you know, across the denomination, and not ours only, but other denominations as well, of ministers, of young men and uh, going into the ministry. And so right now the ministry department is really having to be cut back. We're reducing the numbers of uh, professors and things. And uh, it is just uh, at this point kind of holding on, which is uh, um, a very difficult time. And uh, when I was speaking with Dr. Lau, I got there Tuesday afternoon and he I happened to be outside of the Chapman Seminary and I happened to uh, see him. So I pulled into the parking lot uh, which, by the way, is right catty-cornered across the street from the house that Kelly and I lived in. And that house is still standing. I was amazed at that. So uh, I got to go by and see where, where we lived when we left 30 years ago and came home. But um, got to visit with Dr. Lau. And as we were visiting, um, he, uh, he asked me, he said, well, what, you know, he said, looking back on 30 years, what did you take from here? And I said, that I did not pay nearly enough attention while I was here. <laughs> I said, I did not do justice to my time while I was here. Um, and, uh, but I think probably a lot of us probably could look back and say those sorts of things. Um, but it was a good opportunity to be back. It was great to be able to visit with uh, some of the current uh, faculty and uh, to be able to visit with some of our young people. The college is doing well. Otherwise, uh, it is growing, and uh, so we praise God for that. But just do please continue to keep uh, those in the decision-making processes in your prayers. So I uh, just wanted to fill you in a little bit about that and uh, the wonderful opportunity we had this week. This morning, kind of as a result of some of the things that I have, I've had several conversations uh, the one with Dr. Barber, with Dr. Lau, with some other conversations with some others this week. And uh, as we were, have been thinking about, you know, post-Easter, there are a lot of wonderful, wonderful, rich events that took place after Easter. Uh, 
We talked last week about making the full use of our time in our service to the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things that happened, and we shared a little bit of it last week, but we're going to go ahead, and I hope that you all understand this. You will find me, and this morning will be uh, very similar, that I will refer back to some scriptures in the Bible that I have used recently. It is because of the fact that the Word of God is a living Word. And any time that we pick the Word of God up and the Word of God becomes dead to us, we had better fall on our knees before God and we better begin to pray. We ought to be able to open the Word of God and even though we may have read a passage yesterday, we ought to be able to go back today and find some richness and some nourishment from the Word of God that applies to our heart today. So I want you to understand that because there is a, an importance to what is going on. In having talked to Dr. Barber and to Dr. Lau, and you know, sometimes I, I haven't always focused on it, I try to, and I've shared with some of you all the rich history. Growing up as a preacher's kid, I didn't appreciate having to be in church as much as I was in church at that time. But now looking back, I appreciate that. I appreciate sitting under the preaching, even as a small child, and having no idea how the preaching of some of those old men that came and held revivals and filled the pulpit from time to time, the importance of things that I learned and the things that I understood at that age about the Word of God, the inspiration today that I find by thinking back on them, thinking back about their passion. Folks, we ought to have a passion for the Word of God. The Word of God ought to stir our hearts. Paul in, in the first Corinthians said that I preach no other thing than Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The most important message that can be given, the most important message that can be applied to our lives today is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Our Christian legacy, our life legacy should be built around Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I think back to the lives of the disciples as they were in this transitionary period between the death of Christ and the day of Pentecost. A time that they, Jesus is gone, that we've seen him, he's, he's returned, we've been inspired, and yet now he's gone. What do we do? What changed them from the common men of everyday life to being fully focused champions of the salvation of Christ. What happened in their lives? And today I even ask this because we discussed this both with Dr. Barber and with Dr. Lau and with some others this week visiting with the campus pastor and with others that I've had conversations this week. <clears throat> what are we missing? And I think one of the things is that we're missing that empowerment by the Holy Spirit of God. We're not fully immersed in the power of, of God. We're not allowing God's power to flow through us. The Bible very clearly commands and teaches us to quench not the Spirit. But I think in many instances we find ourselves quenching the Spirit. And we quench the Spirit by allowing the focus of our lives to be on things other than what God has for us. We quench the Spirit by uh, getting our lives and our minds focused on the things of the world rather than the things of God. We begin to quench the Spirit when we step back and we think, I've got plenty of time, I'll eventually work for God. Instead of getting up every day and being like Paul who said, I die daily to Christ, getting up and preparing ourselves, God, what would you have me do today? What is your will for my life today? And you might say, well, I've got to go to work, Pastor. I've got bills to pay. I understand that. But you can still serve God in your work. You can still serve God in your home life. You can still serve God in your social walk with the Lord. And those things should not change just because we're not sitting in the church house. Those things are ought to be carried with us every single day. So what are we missing today? This morning, the title of our message is going to be the centrality of the gospel of Christ as our life focus. 
that our lives are focused on the gospel message of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. I didn't, I was, I'm not a good writer. I'm not, it's obvious I'm not good at English. Y'all figured that out. I don't remember what point of writing that this came about. But I do remember that there was a time when we talked about answering some questions in your writing. The who, what, when, where, and how, and so on and so forth. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, if you would like to turn with me this morning. As Jesus is there at about, about to ascend to the Father. There's so much written, richness, there's so much for us that is found in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And these questions of who, what, when, and where, and how even, are all answered in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 for the born again Christian. For those who would be the apostles, the disciples of Christ, those who would be sincere followers of Christ. When Paul, or when Jesus stands there and says in Acts 1.8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The first question is the who. Who shall receive power? We shall receive power. When? When the Holy Spirit comes upon us. When does the Holy Spirit come upon us? Today, it is the day of our salvation. Then we receive Jesus Christ and we receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that comes in. And the Holy Spirit is what molds and makes our lives. Folks, the greatest thing that you can do, although we still have some uh, responsibility to the law, to the Ten Commandments, uh, but that they will be fulfilled through Christ. But the greatest thing that we can do is not to go out and to be like the Pharisees and have a cold, just decided, day-by-day uh, -day walk with uh, inside the law that just we become very rigid in the law. But that we become so supple, that we become so committed, that we become so focused on the power of God in our lives in response to the Holy Spirit, in response to the Word of God, that obedience flows out of our lives willingly, that obedience naturally comes forth out of our lives. That is something that becomes a natural part of us, that the boundaries that we say set in our lives that will not go beyond this boundary is within the parameters of what the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And not what we have decided for ourselves. Not what we have put aside for ourselves and said, well, this is the way I want it to be. You shall receive what? The power. When? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the how. You, what? You'll be witnesses. Where? Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, and to the other, uttermost parts of the earth is Where? Think about that. This is the point that I think about often. You shall be witnesses to me. Without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, Peter, James, John, on down the line, those guys were not very good witnesses. Today, without the guidance, the direction, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit by the work of Jesus Christ, born into this world, living a sinless life, dying on the cross, resurrected from the tomb, ascended and sitting at the right hand of the Father, and now making intercession for us. Without that, we would be terrible witnesses. We are terrible witnesses. Christians, the last things that we need to be in this world is a terrible witness for Jesus. You are some kind of witness. What kind of witness are you? When you go out into the world, when you go to your job, in your home, at your social life, what kind of witness are you? And is your life being changed day by day by day, drawn closer and closer and closer to Jesus Christ because He is the central focus of our life? Or have we pushed him aside have we put him back in a corner somewhere of our lives 
where he's out of sight and out of mind. I, I only want God to be my emergency service, but I don't want God to bother me otherwise. Apart from Christ, we are lost and depraved. What we try to find is fullness and meaning in life and legacy. All of those things should be built around Jesus Christ as the central focus of our lives, just as he is throughout the Scripture. If I am anything, it's only through Christ. This week, even though there were only one, there was only one of my religious studies professors who was there. Dr. Lau was the only one that's left and he's retiring. <clears throat> it was humbling. Humbling to stand in that chapel service and to speak. Because anything that God has allowed me to be in going on 35 years of ministry, 52, year, 52 and a half years of life, 30 years since I have graduated and left that place, I owe all of it to God. It's his. If I can do or have done anything worthwhile in this life, it's only because of God's blessing on me. If I have anything here that I've accumulated, it's only because of Christ. And if I have any hope beyond today, the only hope that I have beyond this moment that I'm standing here is through Jesus Christ. You shall be witnesses. What would he be witnesses of? It's real simple. We are to be, we are to be witnesses of the living, risen Christ. That is is what we have been called to be witnesses of. That's what we have been called to walk in. That's what we have been called to focus on in our lives. That's what we are to be. Folks, these apostles, after the Holy Spirit came upon them, these apostles believed in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sin and the victory over death, hell, and the grave and his intermediary work on our behalf, they believed so deeply and so powerfully in the resurrected Christ that the whole of their living and dying was focused on him. When Stephen was martyred, he looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus welcoming him. Turn with me, if you will, this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We used a portion of this on Easter Sunday morning, and I want to go back and emphasize some things that were not the emphasis of our Easter Sunday morning message. 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> While you're turning, I again want to remind you, I'm I'm not going to have you to turn there. You can go back and read later. But early in 1 Corinthians, along about chapter 1 or so, uh, maybe into chapter 2, Paul is talking about the purpose of his ministry. We know in Galatians he said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's not I that live, but it's Christ who lives in me. To the church in Corinth, one of the very first things that Paul had to tell them is that I don't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, but I come to preach to you Jesus Christ and him crucified. Salvation to those who will believe and foolishness to those who will reject. Folks, times have changed. Technology has changed. Society has changed. Governments have changed. 
But there is one thing that is still the same. It is still as powerful or maybe even more powerful or more important today that we gather this into our lives. And that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. The world needs to hear it. The world needs to see it. The world needs to know today that Jesus Christ is our only hope. That the legacy of our lives is not built on our accomplishments, our bank accounts, or any other thing, but the legacy of our lives ought to be built entirely around our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know that there are some of you that are older. I hope that some of you younger people have seen it. I hope that you have walked in it. But there are, I know some of you that are older that we could begin to sit down together in a conversation like this and we could begin to name names of ministers and of Christians and of people of various churches that we've grown up in in this area. And yeah, there are funny stories and things about the way that they lived, but the most predominant conversation that we would have is that the entirety of their legacy was built around their focus on Jesus Christ around their relationship with Jesus Christ, around everything that he had done in, the, in their lives. Folks, we have celebrated Easter. There is nothing, there is nothing in this world that's more important than what Christ has done for us. We ought to be built up in that. We ought to be inspired in that. We ought to grow in that. And we ought to hunger and thirst for it. We ought to want it. We ought to crave it. I don't know if you've seen people who crave drugs or craved alcohol and things. Folks, we ought to crave the presence of God. We ought to crave the Word of God just as much as anyone craves anything else in this world. We ought to desire it. We ought to want it in our lives. Listen to what Paul says here as he has already shared in the early part of 1 Corinthians that he preaches Jesus. Listen to what he says here in chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul begins in verse 1, that he had a message to declare. I want, I want to ask you today, church, it's not just preachers who have been called to declare the message of Jesus Christ. We all have been called to declare the message of Jesus Christ. Do you have a message in your life that stands out? Do you have the message of Jesus Christ? Oh, we carry lots of messages. Kind of like we were on Hee Haw, you know. We're not going to repeat gossip, so you better listen first to close, time, the, close the first time. Okay? We don't mind carrying that message. We don't mind getting, uh, conversating about the news, about the weather. We don't mind now today on, on uh, you know, social media, on technology to get on there. And boy, there's all kinds of messages that are going out there. But what about the supreme message of Jesus Christ. Paul said it was a message that should be declared. He said it was preached. How do we come to faith in Jesus Christ? The Bible says, how will they believe unless someone does what? Preach the word of God to them until they hear the word of God and it's brought into their lives. He said it was preached and then notice what he says about the people. He said, and you received it. Receiving is not hearing. I don't know if you saw it this week or not. I shared on Facebook, on, on our page, on the Risen page as well, a, a wonderful article about the birds from the parable of the sower. And if you have not read that, I would encourage you to go back and read that. And when you get finished reading it, read it again. And when you get finished reading it that time, read it some more. Pay very close attention to it. 
Because when we come into God's house, I want you to know that the devil is coming in right on your heels and he does not want you to receive the word of God. He does not want you to hear the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. He wants your mind on something else. He doesn't even want it. And remember, that was what was cast onto the pathway, onto the walking path, that there was no way for it to go into the earth. It was not to be received and the birds came by and picked it up. The demons came by and will carry it off. We need to be prepared when we come into God's house to receive the word of God. And Paul said, you had been receivers of the word of God. And what happened whenever uh, it, it, they was received? He said, you stand in it. It changed their lives forever. They stand, they are sure of, they are enduring in. And in verse 2, he goes on. He said, it is, it was then and is now the only basis of salvation. Hold fast and endure. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 tells us, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. The Bible says, get a hold of it, grasp it, hold fast, be firm, endure. The Bible says, he that endures to the end shall be saved. The Bible teaches us to persevere in the faith, to carry on in the work, to stay forward in the harness, to strain forward. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Listen closely to the quote from Matthew Henry. The saving truths, the saving truths of the gospel. Of what message? Of the fables? No, of the gospel. The saving truths of the gospel must be fixed, attached, nailed down, screwed down, tied down in our lives. It must be fixed in our mind, revolved much in our thoughts, which is meditation, that we go back and we bring the Word of God forward and we meditate on what does this mean. We read it often and we meditate on it often. And maintained and held fast to the end if we would be saved. They will not save us if we do not attend to them and yield to their power and continue to do so to the end. We believe in vain unless we continue and persevere in the faith of the gospel. Matthew chapter 10 verse 22. He that endures to win the end. Not part way. Not three days after you got saved. He that endures to the end shall be saved. He who walks in the Lord Jesus Christ, he who walks in the gospel of Christ, he and she who is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but they who walk with God and endure to the end shall be saved. When we look at verse 3 in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he says the first and primary message for I delivered to you first of all, the first and primary most important message which was living in Paul and was a central focus of his own life was Jesus Christ, the most necessary truth. And look at how he ends verse 4 and how he ends verse 5. And we're going to get to this in a moment, momentarily. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Verse 4, he was buried he rose again the third day. What? Say it together. According to the scriptures. What scriptures? We take for granted today because we have the canonized Holy Scripture. The Word of God. Paul is just now writing to the Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians. The Gospels have yet to have been written, let alone any of any of what we consider to be the New Testament Scriptures to have been canonized. So when Paul writes and says that Christ has died, been buried, and risen again according to the Scriptures, what Scriptures is he talking about? 
He's talking about the first half of our Bible. He's talking about Genesis through Malachi because that's what they were trained in, because that's what they, rose, what they were raised up in. See, we live under the impression today that the, the Scriptures, as we know it, which we hold to, which we are thankful to have today, these passages like 1 Corinthians 15 that point us very directly to the risen Christ, but that we think about that's where the gospel began. Folks, that's not where the gospel began. The gospel began in the book of Genesis. Jesus Christ began in the book of Genesis and was only furthered throughout the scripture as we go along through prophecies and all of these other things that we've already spoken about. And I'm not going to go back and replow that again. The death and resurrection of Jesus is the total substance of of evangelical truth. In the message of Jesus we find salvation for today and our eternal hope of everlasting life. Romans chapter 4 verses 24 and 25. He said it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Listen closely. Why did Jesus have to die? Because he was delivered up because of our offenses, because of our sins. Why did Jesus have to be raised? He had to win the victory over death, hell, and the grave that, as the scripture says, that we might be justified, that we might be set right with God. We sinned in Genesis 3. We got out of position. God walked through the garden and said, Adam, where are you? was not a question of what tree are you hiding behind. But where are you spiritually? Because you are separated from me. And we have remained. And if you are in your sin today, you are still separated from God. But through the death of Jesus Christ and through his resurrection, we have victory over that. We are brought back together. He, was, he died for our offenses and he rose that we might be right, that we might be set right with God, brought back into that relationship. Without the resurrection of Jesus, there remains nothing for our faith and our hope to be founded on. Nothing. Without Jesus Christ, there is no hope. Without Jesus Christ, there is nothing to have faith in. Without Jesus Christ... Look, God commanded the children of Israel back in the Old Testament not to follow the idols. He said, what are they? They're handmade out of wood, having eyes they can't see, having mouths they can't speak, having hands they can't do anything, and feet they can't go anywhere. But he alone is the living God. He alone is Almighty God. And that's the God that we follow. And that's the God that we have hope in. And that's the God who has paid the price for our sins. I don't know, folks, but I want you to know today that we should be constantly in awe of the grace, the power, and the gospel of all that Christ did to save us, that we are regularly humbled. And I want you to know today that's the first thing that ought to happen in our lives, and it would do us well, is for us to be humbled before God. The Bible teaches us that before we take one step before God, we don't come in pride. We don't come in arrogance. We don't come in a, a, a blown up sense of who we are. But we come humbly before God. The Bible teaches us to come humbly, humbly before the throne of grace. And even today we ought to be humbled when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about the God who came and gave his life for us. It ought to humble us. But we shouldn't just remain and we ought to be humble before God but we ought to be rejoicing that we ought to be overwhelmed with joyful praise to Almighty God because he won that victory for us because he did that work that we could not do on our own I'm gonna paraphrase Romans chapter 3 verse 24 it is by the grace of God through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus that we are freely justified not by what we can do, but by the grace of God which is in Christ, through the redemption that's in Jesus. If you are familiar with the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28 begins in verse 18, and Jesus began to speak there to the disciples before he ascended, and he said, all power. The very beginning of the Great Commission is a reminder to us, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. What does that mean? 
that all power or all authority proves that he was the acceptable gift of salvation to overcome our sins. I go back to verses 3 and 4 according to the scriptures. I want you to know that in verses 1 and 2, and all, all four of these verses, and matter of fact, on through, time does not allow us this morning to preach through this whole chapter. But this whole chapter is about the victory that has been presented to us, the opportunity for victory that's been presented to us by Jesus Christ. But in verses 3 and 4, Paul writes here and refers back according to the Scriptures, according to the Scriptures of the Old Testament. <clears throat> the Bible teaches us that Christ was prepared, set aside, foreordained before the creation of the world to be our Savior. That he would come from the splendor of heaven, live a sinless life, give himself as our sacrifice, save us from our sins, and be resurrected for our eternity, and that he will reign supreme in heaven. In the Old Testament, we find what we call types and shadows of Christ, and I'm going to go through some of those real quickly. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I do have a fairly lengthy number of just, these are pretty simple ones. Most all of you are going to be very familiar with these. Genesis chapter 4. After Adam and Eve sinned and God had come to them and, and began to, to talk to them after that and they were about to leave the garden, we know that when they sinned, when their eyes were open, they were ashamed because of what? Their nakedness. So two things happened. They went and hid themselves and they took fig leaves and they made aprons or clothing, you might say, to cover their nakedness. The fig leaves were not sufficient. So in Genesis chapter 4, God does for them something that had not been done. Life had not yet been taken on the earth as far as we know. Everything in the garden was harmony and everything was living together and, and death had not come. But God took the skins of animals to cover their nakedness. There was a sacrificial covering of their sin that took place. Death had to come. God didn't just snap his finger and animal skins appeared. Something had to die. Blood had to be shed because they had sinned. Genesis chapter 6 verse, verse 8, a little forward in time, sin has come into the world and has grown rampant. And the Bible says that the minds of man was on sin continually. And God was displeased and so God came to destroy the earth. And in the meantime, there was a man who was a follower of God. As far as we know and as far as God records, the only one. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Folks, Jesus Christ is our grace. He's represented in the grace that Noah found in the eyes of the Lord. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, God gave him a plan. This is the only way. Build an ark that you and your family, you and your sons and your wife and their wives might be saved from this destruction, from this, from this judgment that is going to come. And so God allowed an ark to be made and gave Noah the time and a time of grace and he allowed him to build the ark and the ark was the only way to continue to live through this flood and that ark represents Jesus. In chapter 8 verse 1, God remembered Noah after the waters were receding. God remembered Noah. Folks, I want you to know today that God remembers us. If God, if you are so important to God today that the very hairs of your head are counted, I want you to know that God remembers you. And if you are in your sin, God remembers you. And God knows that Jesus Christ is the way for you to be out of your sins. But God knows who we all are and God remembered Noah. In verse 18 of chapter 8, Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. They went in to something new, something fresh, something that was lacking at that moment. 
from the clutter of the sin that was pre-flood. The Bible says that through Jesus Christ we have hope for what? An eternity in heaven. In Genesis chapter 12, God comes to a man by the name of Abram and establishes a covenant with him that separates him from even his family. Abram became a chosen man of God. God called him out, promised him a land, made him the father, the beginning. Jesus Christ is the father of our salvation. He is the beginning, the first fruits of our salvation, just as Abram was the first fruits of the Israelites of that day. In Genesis at chapter 18, Abram and Lot have separated, and Lot has gone to Sodom, and God's going to destroy Sodom. And Abram becomes an intercessor on behalf of Sodom. And Jesus Christ today is our intercessor, calling out to God on behalf of us and our sins. God, uh, Abram called out for the grace of God, interceding on behalf of his family in Sodom. In Genesis chapter 21, Isaac, the son of promise, is born. In Luke chapter 2, Jesus, the son of promise, is born. God told Abram that he would have a son. God prophesied in the scriptures all the way through that Jesus Christ would come. Isaac came as a replica son of promise to Abram in his old age. And Jesus Christ came as the son of God, the one that was proclaimed to come the one who was prophesied to come, and he became the son of promise. In Genesis chapter 2, 22, Abram has to sacrifice Isaac to God. But as he and his son, as Isaac, were going to the top of the mountain to prepare for this, and Isaac said, Dad, we have the knife, we have the wood, we have everything, but where's the lamb? And God said through Abram, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Abram was learning firsthand of the agony and the misery that God the Father would go through as Jesus hung on the cross for our sins. Genesis chapter 39, Joseph in Egypt becomes salvation for the lineage of Israel. Exodus chapter 3, Moses is called at the burning bush to lead out the Hebrews from captivity. One leader one, only one by whom they could get out. Exodus chapter 12, we have the Passover. And the Passover represented salvation through the lamb. The lamb had to be brought in, had to be uh, the one without blemish and without spot. The life had to be taken, the blood had to be sprinkled on the doorpost in order that death might be passed by. And Jesus Christ has come and died on the cross, resurrected from the grave, that the spiritual death might pass us by. And that we might have life. The firstborn of all of Israel lived because of that Passover lamb. Today we live because of Jesus Christ. Going on in scripture, the tabernacle, the temple, the ark of the covenant, the mercy seat, the sacrifices all point to Jesus Christ. Joshua, the leader into the promised land, points to Jesus Christ, the one who will provide the way for us to go into heaven, into our eternal promised land. Paul said, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, and he's talking about these Old Testament scriptures. When Stephen stood before the council, when Philip stood before the Ethiopian eunuch opening the book of Isaiah, when all of the apostles were out teaching and preaching from time to time, where did they begin? They didn't begin just what we would consider to be in the New Testament terms at that point, but they went into the Old Testament and they brought forward and they shared all of these types and shadows of Christ and they preached Jesus through the Old Testament unto the people. They stayed true to the gospel of Jesus because they were empirically convinced that Jesus alone is salvation. You never have to question when you read Paul's writings, is there any other way? Because Paul would very quickly and often tell you that it's all about Jesus Christ. Folks, if it's that important to Paul, if it's that important to Peter, if it's that important to James, if it's that important to John, if they were willing to die for what they believed in, how important should it be to us today? How many of us are stepping up and saying, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ so much that I will die for what Christ has done for me? All of a sudden, 
we back away. You must be talking about somebody else, preacher. Well, that's only for people that are specifically called to certain types of ministry. That's not for me. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. He's very clear about that. Folks, as they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to become witnesses to the risen gospel of Jesus Christ, so should we be that firm in our faith and our witness. Just as those that we read about today were empowered by the Holy Spirit to become witnesses to the risen gospel of Jesus Christ, so should we be that firm in our faith and witness. The power of Christ's work of salvation, the resulting change in our lives, and the hope of eternity with him should build in us a tremendous desire to be always pleasing in his sight and prepared with joyful anticipation to meet him at any time. The Bible says that the Lord's going to come as a thief in the night. When I spoke to the young people at Oakland City the other day, I talked to them about their legacy. Some of them are about to graduate and leave and go out into the world and decisions are going to have to be made. I used a portion, some of the thoughts of a sermon that I shared last May with our graduating seniors last May of the story of Lot. Be careful where you pitch your tent. Your legacy is not going to start one of these days. Your walk with Jesus shouldn't be something that you look ahead and say, I, I'm, I'm going to get that walk with Jesus one of these days, or I'm going to improve my walk with Jesus one of these days, or I'm going to build on my walk with Jesus one of these days. Our legacy starts now with our focus on Jesus Christ. There is nothing more important that will ever happen in our lives than our relationship with Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Listen. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Sanctify the Lord in your life. Sanctify God in your life. Build up God in your life. Become so focused to God that you are always ready to give an account, a defense as to why you have hope. There's a song. Everyone here knows it. Because he lives. God sent his son, and they called him Jesus. Why did he come? He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died. It took both. Along with the resurrection, he lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, I know who holds the future. And life is worth the living. Just. Only. Because he lives. Is he living in you today? And if he isn't, why? Why would you pass up this opportunity to know him? Why would you pass up a day of the joy of walking in Jesus? A day of the peace of having him in your heart? A day of having the hope that if something happens, guys, life comes at you fast. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We need Jesus today, and we need Jesus every day, and we need Jesus all day, every day, until he comes for us. As our musicians come this morning for a time of response, where's your focus?
Are you struggling in your walk with Jesus? And it may it be because your focus isn't on Jesus as a central focus of your life? Is it because you're not enduring? Is it because you're not moving forward? Is it because you're not growing in your walk with Jesus? Do you feel like you're just stagnant and you're not going anywhere and nothing's happening? It very well may be because we somewhere along the line began to quench the Spirit and we've gotten so accustomed to quenching the Spirit of God that we're not heeding the Word of God, that we're not empowered by the Holy Spirit. Folks, you're a witness. Every single person here who names Jesus Christ as their Savior, you are a witness. Everywhere you go and everything that you do is a witness. Either a good one or a bad one. Either an honorable witness or a disgraceful witness of what Jesus Christ stands for. I say, boy, that's awful strong. Yes, it is. But I want you to know today that what Jesus Christ did on the cross for me is strong. And I believe in it emphatically. I believe in it 100%. There's been times that Satan has come along and has put doubts in my mind. Does the Lord really love me? I want you to know today that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves me and that I am in his arms and that he has saved me from my sins and that I have a place in heaven with him for all eternity. Let's be found serving him. But today, if there's a barrier... Come and make it right. Come and pour it out to the Lord. Come and, and it's okay to tell the Lord, God, this is the barrier. And you know, God already knows what it is. Tear down the barrier and get it out of the way today. And let Jesus be real in your life.